It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jackie Watts, OAM, as our guest speaker this evening. Uh, I suspect she's known to some of you through her work as the chair of the Melbourne Maritime Heritage Network and its informative monthly newsletter. Uh, just a little background, if I may. Jackie holds a doctorate in education from RMIT, postgrad qualifications in teaching and librarianship from Melbourne Uni, and a Bachelor of Arts from La Trobe. She served for three years as a City of Melbourne councillor, as well as many other local government community focused organisations. She is no doubt well versed in the challenges of public office, and she was awarded an OAM for her service to the community in 2019. More recently, in her distinguished career, she became founder of the founder and chair of the Melbourne Maritime Heritage Network, as I've just mentioned, and a board member of the Offshore and Specialist Ships Australia organisation. She's also an active lobbyist in the Australian Heritage Advocacy Alliance in Victoria. Jackie has a keen and abiding interest in heritage recognition, <coughs> preservation and celebration and in particular, maritime heritage. Given her wide experience and knowledge in these areas, I believe she's eminently qualified to talk to us this evening on maritime heritage issues in Melbourne. So thank you, Jackie, for coming along, and a very warm welcome from all of us. It's a pleasure to be here. I think most of you do know me. I've been banging on regularly for the last three or four years. The reality is I was banging on long before that. I was actually on Melbourne City Council for a decade. But it was six years into that decade before I was aware or made aware on council that we even had a waterways branch in the city of Melbourne. Now think about that for a minute. Six years, no one thought it was worth mentioning within the whole administration that we had a waterways branch, that we were in fact a great port city. Isn't it an astounding case of amnesia, generally? <laughs> So I went, I was invited down to North Wharf by the <coughs> Heritage Fleet, specifically the Wattle, and to see they were going to be bumped off their berth. Could I do anything? Well, yes, I said, who, who are you? What do you do here? What is this going on? Nothing was going on. So I took it upon myself to write quite a long piece about and analysing why on earth nobody knew anything about maritime in this fine city of ours <coughs> and that prompted me. I had then the support of the CEO of the City of Melbourne who was a yachtsman and I decided the only way to go because I'm a great believer in networks and all of you here are part of my network. Fact. We can only get things done in this city if we link with others and that's what the network is about. And I couldn't do what I do without my board network. And what I brought for you tonight is a <coughs> historian extraordinaire whom you've already heard with his other hat on. He has several hats. We all probably do. Um, and so Michael O'Brien's going to unpack for you in a very, I think, gripping way the maritime heritage of this state to an extent, this nation. The reality is, and I'm really pleased to, that this, the Navy is still a presence in our city. I worry a bit, and you mentioned before, reference to some the meeting happening in Sydney. I worry about the Sydney centricity of matters maritime in this country. And I've been working very hard to change that. I went up to Sydney and met with the Australian National Maritime Museum, said, enough, what are you doing? And they said they were the worst funded museum in Australia. Da -da 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 -da. Well, I'm working on it. Just a couple of weeks ago, I discovered that Paddy Cromlin had been appointed as the union member on the um, board. Yeah. So I immediately wrote to him saying, what do you think you're doing? You know, get your act together. There are, there's much more of interest in the maritime sector than Sydney. We have to do something to change the Sydney mm -hmm. city. Anyway, that's a particular bandwagon I've got at the moment. And now I'll just shut up for a while. There'll be time for questions afterwards.
but just keeping in mind the networking, the Sydney centricity, the fact that we have amnesia writ large around maritime matters, and I'm going to now hand you over to Michael. There'll be a little sort of uh, jiggery pokery here for a moment. I feel like, you know, Please. that was the ventriloquist, I must be the dummy. <laughs> 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 I don't say anymore. <laughs> we'll fidget this around for a moment. Um, so, what I'd like to do is to take a wander through Melbourne's maritime history. Um, we've got a quiz coming up for kids later in the week. Uh, you know the answer to this question. I'm going to put the question to the kids, or at least somebody else is. Which is the bigger uh, volume of water, Port Phillip or Port Jackson? Port Phillip by a factor of many, many times as, as it happens. I mean, it's just one of the people, the Cedar Harbour is used as a measure of um, dam capacity. Perhaps they should use Phillip Harbour. That doesn't go nearly as well. It's about maritime city. And my question is what are we going to do about it? And we'll lead up to that. But I think, first of all, one has to understand our history. That's our logo in Melbourne Maritime Heritage Network. Um, it was. It actually has seagulls in the back of it. Quite <laughs> sitting in a lady's handbag next to me is uh, this, which is part of a book. We want to start early, uh, not quite vote early, vote often, but start with the children who know nothing about Melbourne's maritime history. And this is the end paper of the book that we launched a few days ago. Here it is. <coughs> now there are three parts to my slides. The, the picture, which is obvious. Where it comes from, in this case the State Library of Victoria, and an approximate date. Due to some oversight, I'm unable to get this pictures of Aboriginal occupants <coughs> here of this era and era. Uh, so I've gone to art instead, and I'm quite fascinated by this bathing in the Yarra in 1847. It's a nice depiction of how, for many thousands of years, the river itself and the bay, I say, without too much fear or exaggeration, that this was an easier place for the original inhabitants to live than most of Australia. It had water, it had fresh water, it had uh, adequate wildlife, <coughs> fowl, uh, F-O-W-L, and, and, and otherwise, and, and, and the fish in the sea and oysters and so forth. Yeah. So it was a place which was easier to live, and the maritime element of that was particularly important. One of the few photographs of Aboriginal occupancy is this one, taken between 59 and 63 on the banks of the yard. And theirs was a pretty happy existence, quite a simple existence. You'll notice that there are quite a number of um, <coughs> things, places where I get the photographs. There's a rich variety of photography and maps related to Melbourne's maritime history. We're very lucky that so many of our institutions have digitised this. This is Surveyor Grimes' map in 1803. He made it just before the settlement and Sorrento by a couple of months, as it turned out. And that's his map, which is held here in Rome. And it says quite a lot about the extent of Port Phillip Bay and the surrounding Rome. And he certainly found the Yarra River there up at the top. And his annotations indicate that it was suitable for settlement. We deal with this in our kids' book by making it the facts plain, simple, and well illustrated, and though none of you here are old enough to have grandchildren, if you did, you might want to uh, consider a Christmas present in this particular book. So, in 1803, the Sullivan Bay uh, settlement again, without many photographers at, all <coughs> at the time, uh, made that unsuccessful, and when you look at it, pretty silly attempt to settle at that point without an adequate water supply. That didn't seem to be sensible. There's a great art collection in the city of Melbourne, and this is in Melbourne Town Hall. Actually, the, the archives of our town hall are quite remarkable. There's an exhibition on Parliament at the moment 
I only wish putting another hat on that they would uh, let more of it be seen by the public. I'm trying for that next year as part of Rare Book Week Norman. This is, I guess, their view. A lot of the local inhabitants and the tent city that grew up early in Melbourne's occupation. I had passed by this one. This is an Aboriginal chap of Aboriginal descent talking about his near Queen Street Bridge. And at Queen Street Bridge, there was the barrier between the freshwater Yarra and the saltwater Yarra which went across there and ships couldn't come up the river beyond the barrier. Blown up um, progressively up until about 1920, Red Queen Street Bridge. This to me is quite fascinating and no longer on YouTube, as it turns out, film, um, showing dolphins in the Yarra. This is the Yarra Bar, so-called, going across the river, and there are several names for it. It was the traditional place where the two branches of the Aboriginal tribes used to meet and meet their girlfriends and cross over the river without getting their feet wet. And there was about a one foot difference in height between parts of the river. With white occupation, um, that became important <coughs> and you can see that it was used by <coughs> both parts of the settlement. 1838 had a well laid out city with vinyl grid. And there are a couple of things you can see in the Yarra there, particularly the and quite natural turning circle, the form of the geology of the river. A turning circle became particularly important later on. <coughs> but in the generous hollow grid, there ain't much built there in 1830. Yeah. Uh, I'll pass that one. And in 1841, the city started to grow. A lot of the early artists were probably of what I describe as the naive school, but they gave a good pictorial impression of what was going on. And the light part of the city was, of course, the river. There was no communication with Sydney other than by ship. In me, my great grandfather carried the first mile overland between Melbourne and Sydney. And that was much later than this. So, without uh, the maritime environment, the river and the bay, there was no Melbourne and there would be no Melbourne. The first bridge across the river was this enterprising chap called Balberni who charged a toll for going across the, the rickety bridge, which didn't last terribly long, and I for one would take my cart across it. It's, in, it's where Prince's Bridge is now. That's the wharf that developed around 1850. 1850, the year of the revolution. Gold, gold, gold. And suddenly you have brick buildings like the Customs House, now serving this name, the Immigration Museum. Um, and the walls along primarily the bank of the Yarra. And the contest in between the ships that came up the Yarra, a difficult creek at the best of times, and those that went to Williamstown. And that made it a difficult journey to get to Melbourne where the people were. So there was always that dilemma in this city of Earth. In 1851, a pretty typical view of the ships in the bay, many, many of them, many of which were abandoned because the crews ran off to the Goldfields. They were going to make better money than they made aboard Jim ship. The location of Melbourne, and this is an 1852 map, which I find particularly interesting, was a, a very coastal sort of place. There were several lagoons and swamps, in particular the Blue Lake, which was quite large. The Blue Lake, under Aboriginal settlement, had reeds and swans and ducks and salty water, and they did a lot of hunting. Uh, and under the white man, we turned it into a rubbish tip pretty quickly. But it had later use. This is a good depiction of the effective width of the Yarra River. It was a difficult thing to navigate at the best of times. 
and a real challenge for the city that needed it. Along came the second bridge across the Yarra in the same place as the current Prince's Bridge, <coughs> with the largest arch in the world at that stage. And if you're an engineer by trade, you would look at that arch and say, mm, it's a bit flat. And indeed, it was too flat. And while it didn't collapse, it came close. So it had to be replaced in 1885. A picturesque bridge joining. Um, the city of Melbourne to the swamp on the other side and uh, Victoria Barracks just beyond the swamp. I like Keppel interview. He had got a grasp of what was right. <laughs> and that still holds true because without our port, where do we get stuff from? Well, we get stuff manufactured in this state. I can't remember what's made here anymore other than Vegemite and cornflakes, not much more, and most of our imports come from overseas. A grasp of the obvious. I like this movie, and I don't think I've got the sound at the moment, but nevertheless, it shows what happens to our port. <coughs> we were a port village, without a doubt. And the river became our port during the gold rush. We fixed the river by the Coot Canal and widening the Arrow. We built Victoria Dock, a marvel across the world still. We had those marvellous things to move cargo, and everything was, to use a technical infantry term, hydraulic. You took it off piece by piece. And if that was your car, you had a one in three chance of it landing on four wheels. <laughs> it was the job of the waterside workers to assign a portion of each cargo to their use. And that was a great tradition. But containers changed everything. And the Port of Melbourne Corporation started in 2003, about the time when the government sold the for a 50 year lease. And now we have one of the most remarkable terminals in the world where you turn up the terminal, the ship parks, I think that's the technical term, isn't it? You throw those ropes and things off, and it unloads itself without very much human intervention. The day the Woodside worker is, sadly, the speaker was a past. And the fact of the matter is, in this Australia's largest cargo container port. Um, that's the way it was. I'll back up a little to about 1853 to when I think the proper name for the city was Snowborn because of what happened in the river. And we judged our progress by the amount of smoke that came out of the chimneys and the scum of the river and all the people the scum. And there was a hell of a lot of Some of it was picturesque. I haven't heard much about this battle stream. There were a few plying the Yarra. And the Yarra was a, a stream used for pleasure as well as for trade. You can see the old bridge in the background. And this is uh, after the gold rush was mature. It's a broken glass negative. You can see the breaks in it. And that's the bar across the river there, later destroyed. There's the turning circle. By 1815, you've got a mix of steam and so which is quite interesting. Really. Another lagoon, of course, was at Sandridge. My recommendation is that if you happen to live in Port Melbourne, don't buy a house within the red area if it's going to rain. It's a bit like living in Elizabeth Street in the city. <laughs> and this is what had happened by 1863. We've still got the Blue Lake, one of its various names. We've got the city of Melbourne. We're starting to develop the railway to the east, across the river. The grid is starting to be populated. And there's a dirty great bend in the river. And that caused 
large irrigation well. Station Pier was a place where many of the larger ships came and Princess Pier. It's badly gone. Station Pier is particularly important. I'm a mad enthusiast. Some say just mad, but let's go with mad enthusiast for Station Pier. It's the only place where cruise ships can come to Melbourne. And the Royal Australian Navy occasionally ties up too, so it's important for that. Yeah. And those cruise ships bring in a lot of dollars, and a lot of people wanting to spend them. I've seen a piece of paper saying it has a useful life in about 10 years. Time to plan a new pier there is probably about 15 years. But the time that government spent is probably as much as three years. I leave the rest to your imagination. The railway on Station Pier, and actually Station Pier has been straightened once or twice in its life. Oh, there's a story about Carl's Wharf. Carl's Wharf was on the Yarra, was a privately owned wharf before the government took over all wharfage. And it is really a quite fantastic story. There was a chap who came out from England and worked as a tally clerk on Carl's Wharf. He later became elected to the Legislative Assembly in Victoria and yeah. later than that went back to England and joined the British Parliament. And among his later um, jobs were um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, First Lord of the Admiralty, Chancellor of, uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Manchester and Secretary of State for War. And I often challenge people to know who the hell was he and why haven't I heard him. It's a great story of an Australian world success. Hugh Culling, early children's. This is him. Yeah. And these are. Went back to the UK in 1857, died in 1896, and these are some of his jobs in Britain. That's a fairly Good CV. Let me pick one. Um, Secretary of State for War. He was part of the uh, Haldane reforms of the British Army, which stopped uh, the officers buying their commission. He really was very much the, uh, the person who set that into train. So, a, a man that, and Home Secretary, I forgot Home Secretary. That, that's a good CV. Paul Starch <coughs> in Melbourne. A picture of New Princess Bridge in 1875 with the industry on the Richmond side. Another big change came in 1876, and I might go back to that, 1876, where the biggest reform was to take the private sector out of looking after the poor. And this act did that. And that took a lot of profiteering, and dare I say, gangsterism out of the port and it started to get organised and it, it had an authority which had the status of the Melbourne America, the Metropolitan Board of Works and the Gas and Fuel Corporation I could tell and all those things that no longer exist and that was an important change at the right time. So we imported an engineer from Britain, the greatest hydrological engineer, Sir John Kerr to look at the river with its bends, and the bend was that way, and he proposed widening the river and cutting a shortcut, creating Coot Island. He also proposed <coughs> that there should be a dock complex in this area, Victoria Dock, Victoria Harbour, and uh, he was very much part of that plan. His Australian offside deserves almost as much credit, but I don't have time to go into that. We give, um, the credit to Sir John, probably wrongly to a large extent. Um, back to our kids' books. Um, you notice the great similarity between what I've just shown you and this, which is simply explaining it to children because they think it's just a bit of water that's always been there. 1880, with sail still on the era, but a good deal of steam as well. And it's a crowded river. We 
when Coon's work was done and in progress, it was a combination of good timing because the depression the later in the 1880s and the 1890s depression meant people were out of work. And if you want to widen the river and dig the <coughs> second largest man-made harbour in the world, um, you need people. Although there was a good deal of equipment used in doing it. And it's quite a story, actually. One of the old steam ferries on the Arab. <coughs> and several of my colleagues have put together the story of bridges in Melbourne, which are particularly important. And some of them are very important. Some stop navigation, and some are stupid because they were too low. Queen's Wharf became one of the main ones, and I put this in to give you an idea of how important the individual as a worker was to the operation of the port. So after 1892, we've got Coot Island and a widened Yarra River, and Victoria Dock starts to be built. Now that was built coincidentally on where the Blue Lake was. There's a good overlap between the so that gave them a head start. But in essence, most of the excavation on that dock uh, was made by hand. Um, central Pier, the thing on which is only half is existing at the moment, and soon to be demolished. The, the uh, western part is part of it, and the southwestern part is already gone. That's quite sad. It was done in about 1906. The Yarra Wars became more and more congested. <clears throat> I'm now going to go on to some of the key naval visits. So here we have the Russian cruiser Bogoy, which means something like dragon, I think. It took part in the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. Right? And the Brooklyn, which took part in Pearl Harbor. And they were two of the ships that visited for Federation. So in Federation, what other nations sent ships to Melbourne, the capital? Well, here we have the Russians and the Yanks. The British sent two, a second and a third class cruiser. And the Germans sent two ships as well, one of which was named Cormoran. Not that Cormoran, but an earlier Cormoran. The uh, guest list I found absolutely fascinating. There were some miscellaneous royal duke and duchesses that came out of the Federation. They had become king and queen. But also in the team that came out from Britain was one Mrs. Keppel. Mrs. Keppel was the mistress of a certain other king. I don't know whether they needed to ship her offshore or she needed to see her and kill her. Uh, no comment was made in the press. These are the German ships, not Mars uh, the ships, and of course pre -Bethlehem. The next great visit was the US Great White Fleet in 1908, requested in part by the Australian government and loved by Brisbane. The number of sailors aboard that fleet is beyond comprehension. 54,000 sailors in that fleet. <coughs> Talk about Mer uh, Melbourne and other cities in Australia being temporarily full of American seamen. Yeah. This is in 1909, and Queens and uh, Prince's War was on the other. Um, the proximity of rail in a time when you had hand handling of goods was particularly important. And the rail proximity to Victoria Harbour, Victoria Dock, made it a very efficient dock together with the warehouses for moving kit straight onto the railways. Picturesque and sometimes further yeah. down. <coughs> Next, of course, it was a large point of departure for Albany and the gathering of troop ships for going to the First World War. And I always find it quite fascinating to look at the ladies' dresses. Now, fashion and visiting ships goes together. One of the 
the troop ships and you notice the bend in uh, hey, Runaway Pier, yeah, it's not Princess Pier, it's Runaway Pier. Um, that was later straightened when they rebuilt it. It's a constant job. I'll pass by the art. Um, Station Pier was quite efficient the sort of handling that was done in the day. In 1924, indeed, next year, by my mathematics, will be the anniversary of the British fleet's visit. Well, two ships came, neither of them had much of a future. Can you identify that one? It's the Hood. Hood. And? The Pulse. The Pulse. And people flocked to Station Pier to see. There were a couple of other destroyers that were parked elsewhere at the time, but that uh, we have in our collection this program, the entertainment in uh, in Melbourne of the British Army, which is quite interesting and it's fascinating to find the endeavour on, on the cover of the uh, 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 There are quite a lot of souvenirs that came out of the time. Well, if the Brits can come, so can the Americans, and they can do it somewhat better, perhaps. And that's just the destroyers in Victoria Dock. Count the destroyers. <coughs> mm. And that's only half of Victoria Dock, with Central Pier in the lower bit there. Mm. What? Central? Victoria Dock is quite a harbour, quite a capable <coughs> But only a capable power in the pre-container days, I remember so. And there at Station Pier is, sorry, Nevada was the one that I meant to say was in uh, Pearl Harbor, not the early one. Nevada got uh, bombed, uh, it, got, it got hit by a torpedo, they um, grounded it on a reef in Pearl, and it slid off the reef. Sand. But they reflated it and was used yeah. as a convoy escort and other things during the Second World War. Uh, quite a bad ship. Um, naval vessels, there were many. You mentioned in passing Wide Earth, uh, which was spoken about earlier. I think I have a photograph of Wide Earth, but that Anzac was yeah. used as a tug during the First World War. I no longer resist Stanley. Um, I actually like this black and white picture, which shows early morning on the docks. <laughs> and it was hard to get, you couldn't do anything without a hat. <laughs> Who knows about the Princess Pier Riot? <laughs> Go back to that. This is a waterside workers' <clears throat> thing, and there are, there are moments when I have less sympathy for them, but there was. Uh, a strike on the police broke the strike, they shot one of the strikers. Yeah. And uh, was there any inquiry? No. That was it. It was seen as just deserts. Those were tough times. And those were tough cops of a different standard. Um, I, don't, I can't date this one accurately. Somewhere between 1930 and 1948, with Victoria Harbour on the bottom left and the quite wide Yarra River, and in still a busy place. But look at the south bank of the river, <coughs> which is, well, a mess of industry. Station Pier is particularly important because some very important people came from overseas. They were called immigrants. Some of them are in this room. We have a lot to answer, don't we? Um, and of course, most immigrants to Melbourne came to Station Pier, which is our other side. Uh, Jackie and I firmly have the opinion, um, well, I think this certainly, that Station Pier is one of the worst arrival things yeah. for cruise ships yeah. yeah. anywhere in the world. It's a disgrace, yeah. and it's where a proper immigration museum should be, and we're fighting for that. Uh, World War II came, and some of the troops heading for the Middle East, where everybody knew they were leaving, except that it was secret. 
um, Victoria Dock from the air, not particularly well populated in 1945, things were starting off again, but the good shed and the railway proximity meant that before somebody, some person um, invented containers, this was one of the most efficient docks around. Plenty of space, plenty of machinery, and plenty of people to do it. We had two piers, yeah. but carelessly we have lost one. Um, that tradition of the streamers, yeah, not yeah. quite evident there. It's gone. That's gone, invented in Australia. Um, brave, courageous, and bold, why it hurt? Because I think you'd need to be all those three things and if you're going to Antarctica at that place, <laughs> would you roll in a wet car, I reckon? <laughs> and it, uh, my message is that the Yarra in particular was the home of the Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition for many years until those wicked Taswegians started from it. Only because they were closer. <laughs> Yes. The migrant story, of course, is of singular importance to us. Uh, the Dan ships, which we're trying to commemorate in various ways through our network, and particularly the first women to end part of that series of Dan ships, is most important to our past history. And they were great vessels. The fishermen's bed in the airfield play a large part in aircraft construction and what success we had in building aircraft during the Second World War. Of course, soon to be developed. Let's hope they get it right. The old Australian ship used to be still tied up to the very end. The hulks. In 1958 is about the beginning of the end of Victoria Harbour because um, we started to get, in 1969, the first container only berth out there on one of the fingers. And Victoria Harbour became overnight a place quite unsuitable for containers. It just didn't work with the containers. <coughs> so um, the demise of dock start and it became, um, well in my opinion, a bit of a wreck. And it's funny because um, the first container ship in Australia, why am I going backwards? No, I'm going forwards. I'm going forwards. Mm -hmm. I have to put this in, I think this is one of the most significant arrivals of two of our vessels from the RAN, uh, one heading to Williamstown, one over which has been fitted out. And another one of the great tragedies is that that capacity of the dock out there has evaporated, I think, is the point as well as the one can think about. So there we have our pretty harbour. It is a pretty harbour and a pretty river, and the majority of it is inaccessible to the public. And if I offer you a contrast between this and another city to our north called Sydney, in Sydney, they're like here, I guess, they have uh, Botany Bay which is where the air container terminal is. But Port Jackson is a place that you can walk around and see the sea. I think Melbourne has turned its back on the sea <coughs> and on the river. Jackie and I occasionally walk along North Bank. Uh, South Bank's been done up a bit, I think pretty tackily. North Bank allegedly has been done up, but it's a disgrace at the moment. It's a shock. And we need to be able to appreciate it ourselves as citizens of this fine city and others to appreciate it as well. We have a river on our doorstep. We have a harbour on our doorstep. We can't see it, we don't value it. Ain't good enough. And so there's a great amount um, dedicated to the port exclusively and the public excluded from it, which I think is a disgrace. Um, this is where the automated container handling is done, which is worth a watch, if you can see. There are proposals to extend it. I know. 
that's 2018 and that's out of date. Um, in essence, this is Australia's most important container port. How long will it remain that way as container ships get bigger and bigger and can't get in the heads and you won't be able to dredge to make them get in the heads and what's going to happen? The lead time for a new port is a long period of time. Uh, far more than I think the focus of governments has been. I'd like to acknowledge all of these people that had nice pictures to tell our story which meant that it told itself in a sense, and we're very lucky to have all those things. So where are we? That's the City of Melbourne's vision for the waterfront. It's actually not that inspiring. And the reality <laughs> is rubbish, <coughs> inaccessibility, and driving a bit of metal. I probably should hand over to Jackie, we think one of the problems is who's responsible for it. There's about a single maritime authority in the Port of Sydney. Those are some of the authorities in Melbourne. I don't want to leave it on too long, you might read it all. <laughs> and these are some of the others. And if you want to run a ferry in Melbourne, you need permission from that first slide. Just about all of those people have a say. It is bureaucracy gone stark, <coughs> staring mad because nobody focuses on the wet stuff and they need to. And we've added Melbourne Maritime Heritage Network to the mix. Now, what do we want to do? We have five things to do. Surprisingly, we'd like to get one mob in charge. Um, I could rate our likelihood of success for the city as well. We're going to get trouble. Most cities in Australia have a museum to celebrate their maritime heritage. We have some small displays privately owned all over the place, none of which, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, added up together to make a decent museum, certainly not of international standard. There is a lack of maritime skills which is associated with the demise of the merchant navy in Australia. So if a kid is interested in <coughs> maintaining maritime engines, there's no way that's going to teach him, and what's more, he's not going to get an apprenticeship and also on an Australian flag vessel, and he wouldn't want to sail on some of the other flag vessels. The Recreational industry around Melbourne, because we have a good harbour, is marvellous, except you can't get your outboard motor fixed. So we want a maritime services depot. Then we want an accessible waterfront from Birrarungma through to the Wolsey Bridge, as a very minimum. Telling people about the story of Melbourne. And I'll stop with my favourite one, which is about Governor Hotham who went to the gas works on the north bank to open it, and Hotham, of course, was responsible for the Eureka stockade, turned up in his carriage, caught a cold, and died two days later. So we had the gas works on, on the site that killed the governor. How many people know about it? There are many, many stories like that to be told to kids and adults to bring our waterfront to life. <laughs> so, I'll let you talk about it. If you press that right hand button, come to the check. So, um, there are, I have to point out, Michael, there have been a few developments since Michael started the five ambitions, if you like, that we have. The reality is there are many more. We actually have, if you have a look at the website now, you'll find about eight. So the kinds of things that we've become interested in is reimagining Station Pier. The reality is it's going nowhere the way it is. <coughs> Ports Victoria have control of Station Pier in the operational sense. They're also claiming to be able to manage cruise tourism. They're hopeless. Fact of the matter, we've met with the management, we've met with the minister, we've two ministers just last week, to discuss what is the problem here. 
they haven't got a clue. But we do. So we have, if you have a look at our website, you'll see that we've nutted it out. I'm using this model mainly. Who here has been to Nova Scotia, the port of Halifax? Trust me, you have. Right. So you'll see that the port of Halifax actually is a very interesting cruise terminal. It's, got, it's an immigration museum, it's an art gallery, it's um, a, a place of, of local produce is sold there, art. It generates heaps of money for the town of Halifax. And the whole regeneration of that pier came upon from community agitation and advocacy. Nothing to do with the government. They persuaded the government and the government made sense of it ultimately. So that's what we're hoping for. Okay, the other thing that we're doing, Michael referred to it as um, the central pier, which is about to be demolished. They just developed in Victoria a real estate arm um, of the state government had carriage of a heritage listed pier in a heritage listed hand excavated harbour. So what did they do? They let it fall into the water and then claim, oh, it's worm infected, we can't do anything, we're infested, we can't do anything. <laughs> so I went down and had a look at what other people were doing around the world. The reality is we have a very good model in a floating pier replacement in Hobart. It works really well, a three-storey building on top of a floating pier, passively heated and cooled because it sits on the water. We've put together a very good proposal and it's with Development Victoria. We're told that it's very well regarded. We're hoping for it around the perimeter of this new pier will be a promenade that people can actually engage with the water. There's a thought, radical idea in Melbourne. Yeah. So that's another thing we're doing. And it's going to be an experience <coughs> centre. Museums are not the go any longer. We all love them, but the young aren't that interested any longer. So we're calling it sort of as a working title, a maritime experience centre. So imagine Acme <coughs> by the water. So we're going to be looking at what the Navy's doing. We're going to be looking at what kelp, fit, kelp collection is and what about wind energy. You know, <coughs> the new and the fun and the exciting things that are happening around. You would imagine in an island nation like ours. I mean, it just makes me sick to think of how little attention our being an island is happening. I've just been, I've just come back from Greenland, but I can tell you, they're a lot further advanced with their maritime understanding than we are, and Iceland too. So the other thing that we're actually working on is introducing public transport ferries in this, as Michael <coughs> said early on, the reality is we've got more navigable waterways than Sydney. You would never know, would you? And nobody can. So we've been to see the minister, we took rabbiting on with the Arab traders. <coughs> all we've got, because we're an organisation without any funds, all we've got is the capacity to advocate and we take it very seriously. And we're beginning to get traction. People are now contacting us, for example, or at least giving us credibility. This book that Michael's been talking about, I want you all to buy a copy one of these fine days, well, was launched at the Docklands Library Theatre last <coughs> Thursday. I invited Ted Bailey to come and launch it. And he was desperate. He's a great maritime enthusiast. He's the patron of the Castle May Museum. He's also chair of the Australian Heritage Council. And there he was, banging on. A very long speech, Michael, wasn't it? Too long. Too long. But <laughs> imagine my surprise when out of the blue, Nick Rees, the Deputy Lord Mayor of Melbourne, rang me and said, can I speak? So yeah, have got them both there, wrap it on all your life, but just give us the money. So they gave us a bit of $2,000 to run the first ever maritime heritage event for children at Docklands. This was the first part, the next part is this coming Thursday, and then on the Sunday it's the, it's the award ceremony for the Children's Maritime Art Exhibition. Tiny weedy steps, but we're determined that kids get it. <coughs> and that is what we're about. We're about doing what we can. So one of the things that's exciting to me at the moment is, I don't know whether any of you saw a documentary 
It's on YouTube. Have a look at it. It's called The Lost City of Melbourne. So I went to the launch at the Melbourne Film Festival last year <coughs> and decided immediately we need a sequel, don't we? Guess what it should be? The it's Lost the Maritime city. Heritage. The Discovered City. Anyway, so it's now we, we, we did a lot of thinking about it, talked to a lot of people in the filmmaking. I know nothing about filmmaking. But there are certain things you have to demonstrate in order to make sure you put yourself in a position where you can actually get funding. And one of the things we've done then is come through with this idea that we're going to concentrate our endeavours not about the loss so much as, anyway, it. You'll hear about it in your due course, because I know you're all going to read my update, I'm sure, about this in due course. So it's it's about, we're looking at three, two, it's called working title, two peers and a shed. You've heard of four weddings and a funeral. Yes. Two, well, there's two peers and a shed, and it's going to be about station pier, central pier, and number five, good shed, which is where Michael was <coughs> discussing with you where the Anari started. And I disagree with Michael around the reason uh, that we no longer have the uh, Antarctic fleet leaving <coughs> from that part of the building. Because the Baltic Bridge was too low. Jeff Bennett built it, several metres too low. So what a deal was that, you know, stupid. Anyway, so politically expedient for it to go to, who knows, it's probably a state of risk. So they would move the stuff down there. Anyway... Well, it is closer. Sorry? It is closer. It's true that didn't seem to bother the Nella Dan, the Bella Dan, all the other Dan's, did it? Mm -hmm. No, it did not. It was Bob, believe me, it was Bob, it was Balti Bridge. Mm -hmm. And of course the Balti Bridge is stopping the talk ships coming right up the, the river now as well. Mm -hmm. Hopeless design, hopeless design. These things never come out of one reason. There's also always a sort of collection of um, difficulties. So Michael actually under a terrific uh, Michael unearthed a terrific um, yeah. video the other day talking about why we don't have adequate museums in Melbourne. You want to look at the way various, yeah. well, well, the whole notion of a museum in Melbourne was politicised. I'm writing it up in the update for this month. Have a look. Have a look at the film yourself. You'll tear your head out because the lack of planning, cohesive long term planning, is. It's a great shame in the city of ours. So that's what MMHN is about. It's about having some good ideas and putting them out in places that we will that will resonate with people. Slowly it's happening. You will notice in the media, I, I am confident because I keep a record on it, <coughs> maritime matters are now appearing with more regularity in the popular media. Fact. So is our organisation successful? Don't know. All I can go on is that anecdotal evidence. And our engagement with the government, which is growing. So I don't know. What I want you to do is have a look at this book before you go. It will be advertised in our newsletter. And I want you all to buy one for the multiple grandchildren that you have. And thank you for your attention. I'm here for questions. If anybody wants to know anything, Michael's the one with the in-depth knowledge. I'm the politician. <laughs> um, look, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but while you're getting your heads around them, can I just kick off? Of course. Um, perhaps with an observation, and, and I guess that is that the maintenance of wharves and ports is a highly expensive business. Mm. And it seems to me, in that list of people there, it would be very hard to identify who had the dollars to do all this. The second, uh, so perhaps you could comment on that. The second point that came to mind was that the station pier is going to be used less and less in the future because of the uh, ferries that are now operating out of Geelong. Now, I presume ships operating from wharves a contribution to their use of the wharves as they do in Sydney and every other port. If they're losing that revenue to Geelong, <coughs> then presumably there's less money going to the government coffers for the maintenance of Station Pier. Um, so that presumably is a dilemma of itself. I, I fully endorse what you're saying about you know, it would be an ideal place to beef up, but with fewer, fewer and fewer ships. 
coming there and generating revenue from the use of the wolf, um, is that going to be problematic? Well, here's the deal. This is, uh, I met last week with Melissa Horn, who's responsible for the ports and, and the infrastructure. And Nina Taylor, who's taking over from Mark, um, Mark Foley, who's the, he's the, she's the MP down uh, Port Phillip Council now. They're not worrying about the loss of the ferry, not at all. Because they know in the pipeline, cruise shipping is going to be, they can take extra cruise ships now. Not that they've got any clue about how to manage the cruise industry, because that bit of the economic pie, if you like, is managed by yet another minister, Steve Dimopoulos. And yet another minister, Brooks, he's a new bloke, um, he's, he's got another aspect of it. He's, he's to do with precinct development. So we've got a lot of ministers worried about. But we've also got an industry that's growing. I think Michael knows, having I mean, Michael lectured on cruise ships in his retirement, and Michael will, will probably have the numbers because he's good at numbers about the growth that's occurring. But no, the loss of the ferries is no big deal. Silly them, I say, because it adds to the length of time to get to Tasmania, and it's not very attractive to drive to Geelong with your family to get on the ferry. But you know, that's their decision. and. What was the earlier point you were, you were talking about? The well, the, the business of uh, wharves in general, the maintenance of wharves, who amongst that long list of people is the one authority? I don't know the answer because you can explain there is no one authority. Who's got gold? The gold is generated by the owner of Melbourne's port. The port of Melbourne Authority is the owner of Melbourne Port. Yeah. Melbourne Port is owned by the owner of Melbourne's port. The port of Melbourne Authority, which is a private company. Now that's, just the, that's just the commercial port. Are you talking yeah. about? The piers. The piers. No, no, the old, that, that's actually the old Ports piers Victoria. Up in, up in Victoria Harbour that are no longer used by commercial vessels. Ports <coughs> Victoria. As well. Mm. It's, a, it's a shared yeah. thing between Development Victoria and Ports Victoria. And even that share is a difficult one to manage. Mm. Mm. And in essence, if you look at the challenges, and there are many with Docklands, Docklands is an area that you could say is without a heart. The heart was the pier. Yeah. The pier's gone. It <coughs> disappeared. <laughs> Which is why we're putting our plan forward and it's been so well perceived. And but the, the, I'll give you a nice example using the Victoria Harbour. On New Quay, um, let how can I explain, opposite the shipping control tower, there's <coughs> a, lo a long stretch of completely derelict wharf. Yeah, the ships do a bit. No, well, That's no, there's no ships that can't go there. Because oh, it belongs to the MAB, oh, yeah, yeah. the developer. So we contacted MAB and said, what's it going on here? Can you at least put the wall back? And they said, oh, yes, yeah, when we built our last high rise. It's, you know, it's so frustrating, and I try and keep myself nice, but it's not easy. <laughs> well, that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> but no. you should be a little bit unnice. <laughs> and You're a politician, after all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've got a question. You do? Uh, well, first of all, uh, this part's not the question, but I asked it when they were building the Baldy Bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it so low? Why can't we... If Sydney can welcome the biggest uh, yeah. miners into Circular Quay, uh, you know, on the ocean side of the bridge, uh, why can't we drive one similar straight into the heart of Melbourne in Victoria Dock. Because they can't that bridge there is going to stop it. It is. And they said, no, we've got to build the bridge low or semi trailers won't be able to climb the, the hill to get over it. Jules, so that's their answer. It's a Can I help? help? Because I've had yes. a lot of involvement with this in cruise ships in, in yep. Saudi Harbour. The larger cruise ships can't mm. get under the Harbour Bridge. The only reason. That's what I just said. Yeah, yeah, I know, but they can't, they wouldn't be able to get under the multi bridge. Well, not now. <laughs> no, no. So that's why they can't get over. Can't get over. Yeah. It's a in Melbourne, there's only one place for cruise ships. Yeah. Station people. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't want cruise ships, fine. Uh, no cruise passenger really wants to go to Geelong. No. And I don't mean to be rude to the Geelong lights. Mm -hmm. uh, and the amount of money that flows into Melbourne currently is huge when during the cruise season. 
which if we want to eschew that, uh, which is what we're doing, um, it's just stupidity. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, the, the loss of Tasmanian fees <coughs> is not significant to that terminal. What is significant is that it's viewed as a profit centre rather than an attraction. <coughs> not optimising the value from tourism. They don't understand the tourism industry because they're in the business of infrastructure. They like the operation of Melissa Ward said this directly to me last week. I am the Minister for Port Infrastructure. That's what she says. But what's the point of that? She's got an arts degree too. <laughs> Let's be careful. The reason I don't have any been down there when there's a cruise ship and there's the Spirit of Tasmania was there, but it was bloody hell trying to get to the cruise ship because all the cars were coming off the bloody the Spirit of Tasmania. People were going on it, and it was absolute chaos down in uh, was it, uh, Port Victoria Melbourne. Street in Port Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And thank God now it's changed. And the first ship arrived today, the Grand Princess, by the way, yes. for the season. But you're, you're right about the numbers. I mean, it's, it's it's becoming bigger and bigger, and it's going to get bigger, uh, the, the numbers of people coming through the port. But, but, through how, there. but how many cruise ships a week would you anticipate? Because there's a lot of time that that wharf will sit empty without cruise ships on. So oh, yeah. you're saying... Let's do more with it. There's lots of other things you could do. Um, with it but, you know, domestic tourism is very yeah. important and it's very neglected yeah. on yeah. here. Yeah. I can guarantee you, having seen the way it works in Nova Scotia, having seen the way it works in Vancouver, Mark yeah. Michael has a lot more experience than I in the various mm. places. Here, but I can guarantee you, Greenland is doing it better. You know, the reality is <coughs> not really. It's, there's only of any given cruise ship coming off the, off the ship and what are they going to do in Melbourne, they negotiate with bus companies and everything right. and so we're actually getting our money in Melbourne. Now if we had more going on on station here, domestic tourism would be greater too because we we're can't get on the pier. You can't right. get on the bloody pier. No, no. As a kid, I used to fish there. Mm -hmm. We go there every day, my wife and I. We well, drive down on the pier. Everybody. Yes, that's that's part of the key. There's a mindset amongst the bureaucrats who are there to get money off the ships that come in. To the, they will only do that and they won't let anybody on. Oh, for so called security reasons. So if you have imagination, story. you could do it as is done overseas. There are port security well, issues around all the wars and ports oh, yeah. in Australia. And it ain't just about security either, it's also about Those new issues. rules about the yeah, well, they, they've, got ship, yeah. they've got patrol boats there yeah. permanently now. Yeah. They've been there for a few yeah. years. Where? On oh, Station Pier, next yeah. to Station Pier, there are patrol boats running around all the time. Police boats or uh, it, it, security boats. It's there. public access to wharves for, for OHS reasons as well. It's probably what? Anyway, that's not such a big deal. Oh, he said the name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there are solutions. We just yeah, do it badly. Oh, I have a question. 
understand how good it is. So anyway. with the consultation, obviously in consultation, we've <clears throat> got a lot of stakeholders. Yeah. What's the position of First Nations on, on the work that's going on? Very little to do with me in this. Because the reality is, there's a, there's a bit of argy bargy in, in relation to which side of the river in what. You know they're two different mm -hmm. indigenous right. groups. Mm -hmm. You'll see in our book we've handled it, or it has been handled. It's, you know, it's real, mm -hmm. but uh, we had a historian <coughs> speak. The very, very first event that we ever convened <coughs> with, with our group was called Looking Out, Looking In. So we got the Indigenous uh, 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 director from the City of Melbourne to come and speak. We got a, a historian, an eminent historian to speak. And a woman, a young woman who was involved in an RMIT with a, a, a project around. So the idea was to put yourself in the mindset of Indigenous people looking out. What did they see coming up the bay? And you'd be surprised what they saw compared to <coughs> the people going up the bay. What did they see from a high ship? No, the Indigenous people had no idea. They were using technology. They had a telescope. It was the first point of cultural clash, really. And how can we actually understand the mindset of, of the Indigenous people? So the City of Melbourne worked quite hard to bring the Indigenous element to the fore at the expense, I might say, of our colonial history. For I'll give you an example of Enterprise Park. So it's now become an area where there are a lot of total like they're not called totem holes, but they're indigenous um, painted holes. And they want to improve the riparian zone along the river. So the city of Melbourne have sunk these mats of reeds and for um, birds and stuff like that. There's a big push on to get rid of the name Enterprise Park. Because I don't need to explain to you why. Just because, there, in my mind, there is no justification for erasing post-Indigenous <coughs> heritage. It happened. Indigenous people aren't so concerned, but it's almost the political correctness of others. Nobody's saying they didn't exist. Nobody's <coughs> saying they didn't actually have a beautiful place to get their eels and shoot their ducks and all of that. But this, the first, as I said to you, the first time we ever had, the guy who was telling us about what was there, the reality was <coughs> the indigenous people had already been challenged by disease coming down mm. the east coast. It, it wasn't about and, and doing, you know, bringing stuff up from Tasmania. They were actually very challenged. Anyway, not you know, regrettable, terrible. But you don't have to, it's, we don't, we're not in the business of cancel culture, are we? No. Who of us is? No. Jackie, you uh, touched on the Antarctic yes. exploration vessel. <coughs> we have a former skipper amongst our... Uh, yes. So I have, uh, I have a suggestion to Michael for his yeah. next presentation. <coughs> you showed, uh, when you talked about North Wolf and the Antarctic, you showed two pictures of Wild Earth. As you know, she never managed to get into Antarctic. So, I would say take one of those pictures off, replace it with Kisa Dan, who was the most famous first ship to go into Antarctica, and she actually loaded at North Wolf, not number five, six, seven, on number three, and she departed North Wolf on the 12th of December, 1953. And she got in, and she established the Mawson base as the first Australian Antarctic base on the 13th of February, 1954. Well, I'm sure that's... Can I... That's like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't got a picture of Keith today, I've got a set for you. So let me tell you something. In my book runs Rare Book Week, amongst other things. <laughs> and he, and, and th there's a whole series of absolutely fascinating lectures throughout the whole week. And one of them, Michael didn't go to, but I did. And it was about very very early days Antarctic exploration under sail mm. from Melbourne. You didn't do that. <laughs> it was before my time. And this man, That's we're unimaginable. Have, we're going to have an event with him. And so, and during, so this is this is this is going to be another one of our plans with Ross Brewer and the Inari lot 
we're going to have an, an Antarctic festival, hopefully next year. This is. Um, You're already having something on the 12th of December mm -hmm. this year. But that's only the early one. That's you know, the first one. No, we want a bigger one because we want to get the kids excited. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I'm hoping this chat from the State Library, who's the expert in very, very early how to um, exploration, I've forgotten his name now, they'll come to me in a minute. But gee, he had some terrific images, you know. They sailed down there, but they didn't get what you meant, what you mean. they didn't have power. So they would sail against an iceberg and, and didn't understand that there was a wash back. And he's got this great image of two sailing ships between icebergs backing one another because it was really hard to. Anyway, I love. I've been to Antarctica or there about three times now. I really, I'm a bit addicted to it. It's a good song. He's only been a few <laughs> times. I've been there several times. <laughs> Lucky man. I actually saved on the Tisa thing and I saved on the Taylor thing in Antarctica. Lucky man. So, any questions? Oh, anything else? Yeah, just one more. Uh -huh. Michael, I think I think I've correct. You said that the the useful life of Station Pier expires in ten years from now. Yeah, I'd seen a piece of paper saying that. Um, it's a government statement, and of course, if you hold them to account to that, uh, you'll probably get it denied. It's in one of the planning papers, and they would to quiet as a planning paper only. So is the cruise industry aware of that? Uh, broadly speaking, no. The cruising industry is a user and they're, they're concerned with uh, getting next year's bookings in. So it's short term. Or, uh, but they're interested in a place to come to rather than its sustainment. Um, the, the current authorities renew part of the peer each year, but they can't keep up with it. It, it, it needs long-term planning yeah. and the alternatives to station pair are as follows. There's a bit of a problem with that. So, uh, earlier I mentioned, or I was Michael, as I talk, talked about Sydney and what they're doing, and I, you know, I did bang on about lying particularly for about the Sydney centricity. Well, it's, in fact, this, the, the, uh, um, since the Albanese government came in, there's been, I think, $32 million that Sydney Harbour has got really? that it didn't have before. Wow. They've actually got somebody running a program to activate Sydney Harbour. So you ask yourself, why, did, why didn't we ask for that money? Where is the Victorian equivalent to... Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, was there any money in for the CF every year? Is there any money yet for the CFM? I don't know, but I, interesting, I actually met people, uh, three representatives from the MUA this morning. No, but not the CFM year. No, so if you get the CFM year involved, mm -hmm. there's a good chance the money will follow. Would, would One you like to give me a call and we can, we can talk about how I might do this? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd be glad to throw in a few ideas. Great, I'm going to give you my card. <laughs> I know. One quick question. Yes. If Central Pier can be saved, would that become a long term home for the vessels like the Wattle, Alma Dopel, and Enterprise? It's not to be saved. It has got, they've led yeah. the contract with the demolition. For the total demolition. They yeah. have. That's why I'm telling you about the floating solution, pier. which yeah. is this floating pier. Sorry, I meant the floating pier. Would that, get, would that have space for the Wattle oh, Enterprise? And I, I need it. A pencil, really. Oh. You, you've got the you've got the central you've got the new floating pier on the left hand side okay. of the new key. Okay. The uh, development Victoria and the waterways branch of the city of Melbourne thinks so that's where the heritage fleet will go. I see. As okay. far as I know, they're okay with that because you see, Lead Lisa building this whole series of heart ah. parts down. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But you know, the time frame on that is fifteen years. Wow. You know, yeah. 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 That's so, what. Can I ask you what the Melbourne City Council has? What water equipment or what, what, what's this? What have they got? Do they have a boat at all? Yes, they do. They so, do? You know, I've, we've no, got, we're doing this children's festival. Yeah. So on Thursday at 4 o'clock, I've got six heritage or maritime stakeholders coming to give brief presentations. One of them is Waterways Branch, and I've said to them, come and tell us about your craft. Well, Terry would know about that. Yes, Terry Boone. 
Yeah, but he's X9 in this book. No, he's X6. No, yeah, that's a little bit. He's the engineer, but he's the engineer. Did you work with the city too? We did container terminals. Did you? Patrick's and the other one. Jackie, just an observation. We talk mostly about Victoria, well, the Melbourne wars. No, 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 no. We, my reports too, we do. We well, so, yeah, all right. Well, I was going to say, does your network take into account um, Williamstown in particular? Of I mean, course. it's a, a heritage precinct. I mean, so, I mean, so I've got um, two, two members of my board living in Williamstown. Right. No, no, it's, yeah. But they've got Melissa Horner as their MP. Uh huh, okay. Six million she's just given <laughs> them to what bill? Um, to uh, fix the three uh, big piers. You know they've had those three piers down there? They've yeah. been shut for one hundred years now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Oh, Jim. Jim? Yeah, Jim. Um, there's and three. Street. There are three. And Street. And Street. Yeah. And Commissioner, is it? Oh, Commissioner is a, used to be the Heart of Trust thing on it. That was a anyway, fair mile. Six million. Bang. The three, <laughs> I think the water police, police want to go in there too, don't they? I think the water police want that to be their new base. Yeah. Which was probably so see, the problem with much of Williamstown is that Parks Victoria are heavily in control. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Spare me. Uh, yeah, a very um, land centric organisation. No, you know, it, it's gossip, but I can explain. I could explain to you about how they got to be so powerful, but it's probably not the main for it. Yeah, yeah they, they made a move. Anyway. <coughs> I think that I, I get a sense, though, that perhaps Victoria has responsibility for wolves all around the state. And uh, the problems you're talking about are magnified in Melbourne, but probably apply in many of the other little ports oh, yeah, around the Victorian coastline, grumbling about the fact that there's we, we we know know issues quite a lot of the coast. Yeah. It's just not that easy. We belong to. That's presentation number two. Concerned about the Sydney centricity of our association. Speaking in favour of them, they have got a great initiative now where they are doing harbour cruises with uh, our members, volunteers, on board a vessel that will carry 50 or 60 people. They charge them and they're taking them all around Sydney Harbour to the various key points, obviously, those that have a naval history and that element. But it tweaked me as I was talking in that last committee meeting. It would be really great if we could do something similar in Melbourne. Tweet now, with me in, in and lobbying for it. And having a cruise once every three months, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But to take people around the various parts of the river yeah. and to Williamstown mm -hmm. um, that explains our naval heritage here. And I'm being a little bit parochial. Yeah. Um, but you, you almost have to be in this. Um, oh, yes. In the port, because <laughs> it wasn't a great naval port compared with all the other shipping that operated in the navy pier. But, uh, I, I don't know. I, so let me you... tell you, the port of Melbourne, the private port of Melbourne, run a, a, a service. It's on their website, and you pay X amount of money, but it's not much, and they'll take you around the port. They're more interested in the commercial port. Yes, it's really oh, okay. what that happens. Oh, I'm going to arrange that. What do they take you in? You know what's happening on the weekend? Mm. You know it's the boat show. First yeah. time yeah. ever. In the water. In the water? In, uh, first time ever because Steve Walker, the heads up the boating industry <coughs> association Victoria, he's on my board. He's arranged for a heritage precinct. 
as part of boat show, a, a part of the boat show. And he's arranged for a small ferry <coughs> called the Grower. You've heard of the Grower? Mm -hmm. Tiny ferry. It's a tiny ferry. Takes probably 25 people. Oh, and it's going to go from what New Key over to North York all day long, bringing people from the yeah, fancy right. dancy shiny white boats yeah. mm -hmm. across to the heritage. Why don't you give it a go? It's the first time it's been done, and you can thank MMHF for that. Oh, well, good. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you and the MH, MMHF. Mm -hmm. and I, I've got dyslexia, so I have a <laughs> But thank you very much. This has been a really fascinating chat, talk, presentation. Very good. Um, stimulated lots of thought, I think. Um, not just thoughts past, but thoughts future. Uh, and one of one of my thoughts that, that hasn't crystallised is, you know, how do we, as our historical society chapter, make a contribution um, in some way or another to the heritage preservation of Melbourne Port, and we can perhaps uh, talk about that in some detail at some other time, but um, uh, I'm delighted that you can come to <coughs> whet our appetite, indeed, if we're talking about such things, oh, and stuff. I really appreciate you coming along, and on behalf of our uh, oh. small chapter, I'd like to thank you very much, Jackie, thank for you. the small contribution. Thank you very much, Michael and I will pop this on I the I hope you do. <laughs> 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 <laughs>